Well, I failed to mention one thing during the announcement time, and that is that if um, uh, you have s- agreed to serve uh, communion by sharing a communion thought, uh, Pastor Bill has prepared the next um, calendar of those, uh, and they are available on the back table in an envelope with your name marked on it. So before you head out today, if you're um, scheduled to share a communion thought, uh, please make sure you check that table and pick up your assignment. Um, Pastor Bill has already made those ready. All right, we are talking through this series, which Pastor Bill has introduced the last few weeks, of I am thankful. Um, As we approach Thanksgiving, it's a common tradition in our household that we kind of reflect on what are the things that we're thankful for. And that may even be a thing that you do around the Thanksgiving table is you go around and you invite everybody to share something they're thankful for. And if you're like my family, you want to go first because you're going to say family and friends. And you know everybody else is planning to say that. So you volunteer to go first so you can take the obvious answer. And then everyone else is left scrambling um, for their response. But today we want to talk about joy being not conditional or circumstantial, but uncircumstantial, unconditional. And I'm thankful that joy is this way for the Christian person. It's not this way for everyone, but for the Christian person, I'm thankful joy isn't circumstantial. In the 1970s, there was a young couple that saved and took a dream trip. It was a bucket list thing for them um, to Europe. They were going to tour Europe, and they needed it to happen on a budget. But they allotted enough money that they were going to purchase a car, a very cheap car, while they were there. And so they bought a little cheap Fiat that broke down frequently, and they stayed in motels that often had electrical and plumbing issues, things that didn't work, or odds and ends that, um, that were defects that needed fixing in order for the space to be livable. It was a good thing that Tim, the husband, was an engineer by trade and was pretty, a pretty handy guy um, overall. <clears throat> It was in the days where you could still fly with a pocket knife, and he had brought his pocket knife from home, Um, but that was the only tool that he had on him, and so he had to beg, borrow, and use other tools at times, but mainly he got really good at fixing things with just that one pocket knife. He became a MacGyver of sorts, essentially. When he got back home to Oregon, um, he started working on a design for a multi-tool, Something that you could just slip in your pocket, but that would be way more versatile than just a simple pocket knife. Something that would prepare him for every circumstance, because he had just been through every circumstance. And he needed something that would fit every occasion. It needed to have pliers. It needed a file. It needed screwdrivers, maybe tweezers, all kinds of things. When he was finished, he patented his creation And he actually found out there were a lot of others that were looking for something similar. His business was born out of that invention. And now 50 years later, his factory produces over 10,000 units every day. I'd say he hit on a win. Tim's last name is Leatherman. I own one. It's my favorite tool. And I can't tell you how many times it's been just the right thing for the job, too. Today, I want to talk about another multi-tool. Um, it's really not a tool at all. It's a practice, something that we put into practice that is just right for every life circumstance you are going to face. It's the kind of multi-tool that helps us walk through life right in the center of God's will for his people, no matter what comes our way. And we're going to learn how to use that multi-tool from the three really short verses that we're going to be in today in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16, 17, and 18. We're going to read those verses together. If you would like to turn there to 1 Thessalonians 5, we'll read them together, and then I'll open us in a word of prayer. Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. 
Let's pray. Father, as we open your word together, I ask that you would illuminate your words to our mind and imagination, that we might see, as your Holy Spirit reveals it, how these words apply to our life, what needs to change in our patterns of thinking and believing, so that we might live aligned with your word. And I pray, Jesus, that we would cherish you above all, that we might desire to live in God's will for us in Christ Jesus, and that we would cooperate with the Holy Spirit as he begins that work in us. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. I may have to take frequent water breaks here. I uh, am still fighting a tickle from last week. Excuse me. While we were at ICOM, I was trying really hard not to cough because we were in a crowd of people, but if you want to clear a path in a crowd of people, cough once or twice. And you will be able to make record time from one point to another. (coughs) Excuse me. Okay, what we just read in these verses are what I'm going to call three holy habits. These are three holy practices. What are they? The first one, and these are like tools or facets, different items in a multi-tool, is joy. You're like, well, this is such a basic thing for you to speak to us about. Joy is listed in the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. It says, the fruit of the Spirit, meaning the working of the Spirit, the evidence, how you can know that the Spirit is in you, what you should see as a result of the Spirit in your life is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There's a kid's song that goes with that. I would encourage you to learn. It'll help you memorize those if you don't know them already. Joy is a fruit of the Spirit. So that means it's partly God's work in us and partly our participation in what God is doing and wants to keep doing in our lives to transform them. And it's more than happiness. It might look like happiness sometimes. In fact, there is a lot of overlap in the Venn diagram of happiness and joy. But there is also a lot of not overlap between those two. Because it is possible to be deeply sorrowful and remain deeply joyful. Joy does not have to look like happiness. It is so much more than that. And the second part of what's on your screen is that joy is rooted in the promises of God. And it's predicated on God's power to complete those promises. Now this is paramount to true Christian joy. Its source is God's power. If God is not powerful, I will not have joy which can be sustained. It will wither in hard times. But when we have joy that is rooted in the promises of God, meaning the character of God and the sureness and the confidence that God is going to complete what he promised he would complete, then my joy, which is predicated on God's power to complete those promises, is steadfast. In the ESV, the words joy, joyful, and rejoice appear more than 400 times. That's a lot of times. We're told rejoice in the Lord or be joyful always, as it says here. So this is joy. The second multi-tool piece is prayer. Now, prayer is so basic that it almost makes me want to glance past it. But if you're like me, you need the basics still. We played, Bobby Knight loved to play fundamental basketball. He won a lot of championships that way. He also was, we're going to leave some of that analogy out um, because there's not a lot of Christian overlap in some of the things that Bobby Knight did as an example. But the fundamentals were important. Prayer is a way in which we enter God's presence to listen and to speak with God. When you pray, you literally enter the throne room of God. You approach God's throne to listen and speak with him. Someone taught me a long time ago when I had challenges starting in prayer. Sometimes you get in a rut and you feel like, I don't know how to pray or what to pray. I sit down, I set my heart to pray, but nothing is coming. 
They taught me a really simple acronym. It's just four letters. A-C-T-S, ACTS. And they each stand for something. A is adoration. They said, just start with adoration. Look at your king in heaven and just start telling him things that you adore about him. Start there. And suddenly you'll find yourself worshiping. C is confession. Now we think of confession and we think of I'm admitting my sins. I'm coming to be fully known and transparent and I'm acknowledging. And that is certainly a part of confession. But there is another kind of confession as well. We confess Christ as Lord. We say, Jesus, I'm coming to you and I'm declaring that I want you to be Lord of my life. And then that may bleed into the other kind of confession where I say, but Lord, I'm not there yet. I love comfort as much as I love you sometimes. I'm just confessing that it becomes an idol to me, Lord. Would you, would you keep me and help me through this? And that turns over into supplication. I'm skipping over T on purpose. S is for supplication, which means asking. So I've gone from worshiping and adoring to confession to now asking, Jesus, be my help to make this transpire and come about and give thanks that he is powerful to do it. There's another thing about prayer is that prayer seeks God's will to be done and it helps us align our will to his will. There's a part of me when I come to prayer prayer that says, Lord, I have these needs, and I'm laying them before you. I have these requests, and I'm giving them to you, but Lord, I'm also giving you space to say, I'm, I have to yield them. I'm not saying, put your rubber stamp on this. Here's patent my idea and approve it. I'm saying, Lord, I'm giving it to you. If it's in your will and your plan, let it be so. If it's not, give me grace to see what you do have for me, and help me to walk in it. And by that, I surrender myself, my will, to God's. And he aligns my will to his. This is so in alignment with the Lord's prayer, by the way. Jesus' model prayer that he taught his disciples. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Let your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as in, his, as in heaven. Even the Son didn't demand that the Son's will be done. But no, Father, your will be done. And in the garden when he prayed, Lord, let this cup pass from me. I don't want to drink this cup of wrath, which is about to be poured out. Let it pass. But not my will, your will be done. Holy habit of prayer. It has a foundational practice in our faith. And then thirdly, the third facet of this multi-tool, so to speak, is thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is simply a form of praise to God in that it recognizes his blessings to us and it becomes a way by which we cherish those blessings and the blessing giver. Pick that up. It's a form of praise where we declare that the giver of that blessing is good and we thank him for his faithfulness and we declare how grateful we are. There's a quote I want to share with you. It's not in the bulletin. It just says this. Thankfulness is a secret passageway into a place you cannot find by any other way. Catch that. Thankfulness will take you to a place with God that there is zero other paths to get to. How so? By it, we enter the dimensions of God's world and his presence and character which are always hidden from the thankless. Inherent in a life of thanksgiving is an ongoing discovery of God's sufficiency, of his generosity, of his fatherly affection, and of his warrior protection. That's where thanksgiving takes us. And when are we supposed to deploy these three tools? Well, it says always, continually, and in all circumstances. Three ways of saying the same thing. Three synonyms. Always, continually, in all circumstances. It's saying there is no time when these are not God's plan for you. 
There is never a time when these three are not God's plan for you. These are his plan for you morning, noon, and night. Day in and day out. Practice joy and prayer and thankfulness repeatedly, ongoingly, always, and regardless of how good or bad things are. They are not dependent on circumstances. Now, these aren't three separate, unrelated habits or practices. They're not like three separate methods or three ingredients, eggs, milk, and butter. I'm thinking about breakfast. They're really more like a muscle group. They work together. And as they work together, they strengthen one another and they interact with each other. So, for example, I could work out my calves to help me run faster or jump higher. But I'll go faster still and higher still if I also work my quads and my hamstrings. It's more like that. Exercise one, and it's impossible to separate the others out. They just get pulled in naturally. Now, the last part of these three verses, I want to pause and sort of take a tangent track, and we'll come back because I think this is so important. It says, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. This is God's plan for you. One of the most common questions that I get asked is how can I discern God's will for my life? How do I know what God's will for my life is, Ryan? How How am I supposed to recognize what God's plan is for me? And I think what they mean, usually they have some very specific instance or circumstance in mind, something they've been praying for, and they would like specific direction and revelation about. Maybe it's, who should I marry? Should I take this job or that job? Should I move my family for this opportunity? Or maybe it's a practical need. I need a car. Which one should I buy? This one or this one? Does God have something to say about that? Maybe it's something even minute. Is McDonald's or Subway for lunch today? We're looking for specific, precise revelation on a lot of things. And those are good questions and beautiful prayers that God wants to hear and have us bring to him. And sometimes God reveals very specific directives to his people. We have pages and pages of evidence in this in the scriptures. Just two. Look at Moses. Moses is minding his own business when he comes across the burning bush. And God speaks directly to him with some clear commands. Go back to Egypt Tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Lead my people out of Egypt and into a land that I promised to provide for them. We look at at Gideon. God shows up to Gideon and speaks to him and calls him a mighty man of valor when he's acting like a coward. And then Gideon says, I'll prepare an offering for the Lord. Don't leave, angel of the Lord. He goes and he prepares an offering and he brings it back. And the angel of the Lord says, place your offering on the altar, but don't light the fire. So Gideon follows the instructions and the angel of the Lord reaches out his staff, touches the altar, and it erupts in flames. And he trembles with fear. This is truly the Lord's messenger speaking to me. And you remember what Gideon did after that? He said, Lord, please be patient with me. I need to know for sure that I'm obeying your teachings and what you said I'm supposed to do, I'm going to put out a fleece and I'll put it in my barn on the threshing floor. And when I come back, if everything is dry around that fleece and my fleece is wet with dew in the morning, then I'll know that you sent me because that's not a natural thing. Everything gets wet when the dew comes. And in the morning he checked and he wrung the water out of the fleece and everything was dry around it. And you remember his next prayer? Lord, I still need convincing. Um, Would you just bear with me in patience while I put this fleece out one more time? And I'll put the fleece out. And and then this time, Lord, would you make the ground wet and the grass wet? Everything's wet around it, but the fleece is dry. if, If you are really confirming this for me, Lord, would you do that? We even have a phrase we say in Christian lingo sometimes. We say, I'm just putting out a fleece. I gotta put out a fleece with the Lord. Meaning we're asking the Lord for confirmation. God, we just need a confirmation. There's nothing bad 
we're wrong about that. It's, it's all through Scripture of people praying or seeking specific revelation from God. But this kind of revelation isn't the only kind of revelation that God wants to send. In fact, it's sometimes the exception, not the norm. Does God give direct revelation like this? Of course He does. Does He still speak to His people today in ways like this? Yes. But many times He does not. And what are we to do to know the will of the Lord? Because it's God's to decide when and how He's going to speak to His people, not mine to tell Him, not yours to tell Him. He is King, not me and not you. And so we come and we ask and we wait with patience and faithfulness. And as we wait, there is a great danger that we may become paralyzed while we wait for God to send revelation. That we might begin to agonize and wring our hands in worry and anxiety, fearful that we're going to miss God's directive or His speaking on a matter that we're seeking an answer for. So bring your request to God. And have confidence that he will direct your steps, either by direct revelation or because he is sovereign and over your life as you surrender it to him. I promise you this. If you come and surrender your life to the king, you will not miss his will for you. He simply needs your yes. He does not need you to know his full plan. And God's will for our life sometimes has latitude to it. What I mean is many times God sets you loose in a place and he gives you permission to move about and live in it in his way. So sometimes our prayer request is very specific and God's answer is pretty broad at times. And I'll give you some examples. How can we live in God's way? Do not sin. Be faithful. Love others with Jesus' love. Learn to control yourself. These are all broad strokes that have a thousand iterations and possibilities to be lived out in our daily lives in different ways as we yield and surrender our life to Him. And you have the Holy Spirit in you, given as a deposit and a guarantee. He will speak to and influence your thoughts and your desires as you seek Christ's will for how to do these things. I think I have a story that will hopefully help illustrate this a little bit. (coughs) Excuse me. I heard a Christian musician asked, how did you know that music was God's will for your life? You can hear the question in the mind of the question asker. I want to know what God's will is for my life. How did you know music was God's will for your life? And this is the answer he gave. Music isn't God's will for my life. I'm sure that was a little shocking, but, but you're a musician. He said, what if I lost my ability to sing or to write or to play the guitar or to be on stage? What if all of those things were stripped away? That's not God's will for my life. God's will for my life is that I would glorify him no matter what circumstances God sends my way. That's God's will for my life. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His perfect, His good, perfect, and pleasing will. We know the will of God as our minds are transformed Our minds are transformed as we surrender our lives to Christ and listen to his word. We know what he has said. So on knowing God's will, his will for you here is expressly stated that we be joyful always, that we pray continually, and that we give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. A final word about this before we turn to something else, and that is that 
if you are surrendering your life to the king, if you're asking questions, God, what is your will or your plan for me next? I have this specific prayer request I've been laying before you and I'm seeking a direct answer. And you feel that you just don't know what God is speaking to you about that thing. If you have assessed that it is in alignment with scripture, if you have sought wise counsel and others have said, I believe this may be God's will for your life, don't be afraid to take a step of faith. Sometimes we have to take a step of faith and test the waters that way. You all remember the story of Balaam and Balak in the Old Testament, the talking donkey? Cool story. I love that one. This pagan prophet had a message from God to be careful to go and speak. He was invited to come and pronounce a curse over the people of Israel. God said, I want you to go and speak, but I want you to speak a blessing. And so on his way, I don't know if he was having second thoughts or thinking maybe he'd get a bigger paycheck from the guy that was paying him to come and do this, but God interrupted him on the way by sending an angel. And then the donkey spoke. Balaam was blind to the angel. And so the donkey said, yo, there's an angel up there. You better not go that way. And he's beating his donkey, and the donkey starts talking to him. I can't imagine. That's such a weird scenario. Why am I saying that? God is going to keep you from going off the rails when you surrender to him. You don't have to worry about, far, I'm going to walk out of God's will, not if you're surrendered to him. Not if you keep laying your life down before him and saying, God, I'm listening. If you take that step of faith and you're worried that might be a step of faith in the wrong direction, God's going to let you know. He can do that. He might even send you a donkey. If he does, I want to see the video, please. <laughs> Get it on video. I got to see it. Okay. We're going to talk about We had had three holy habits. We're talking about three joy killers here briefly. Three joy killers. The first one is envy. Envy is this terrible disease that puts the focus on what others have that you don't have. It is impossible to hold on to sustained joy where envy is present in your life. When you look at what others have, you cannot cherish what you have. And that takes us to the second point, which is discontentment. It refuses to appreciate what you do have. It is the opposite of thanksgiving. The exact opposite. Thanksgiving looks around for the blessings of God. Discontentment puts blinders onto it. Thirdly, complaining. This one is my pet. I keep this one around more than I should. I complain in traffic a lot. I also complain about what's on the news a lot. I complain about the state of our nation. I focus on the negative, and I think that things are not right, and they aren't. But instead of propelling me from griping to prayer, I just sit in the gripe. (laughs) I just sit there with my griping. And you know what it does? It doesn't just prevent me from experiencing joy. It makes the atmosphere real funky for everybody else around me. They're like, man, Ryan, we don't want to sit in your funk. Ugh. Quit complaining. As a matter of fact, we have a specific verse that says, do everything without complaining or arguing. That means watching the news. That means sitting in traffic. That means you fill in the blank for what your particular struggle is. Do everything without complaining or arguing. Many of you know um, the phrase, salt the earth. And that comes from a myth or a legend. We don't know if it's true or not. From the Punic Wars. Um, Scipio was a Roman general who defeated the nation state of Carthage in North Africa. And supposedly, after he defeated them in the Punic Wars, he raised the ground, meaning they tore down every building, and then they salted the earth. Talking about rubbing salt in the wound. Um, They salted the earth, and the intent of that, supposedly, was to prevent that land and to curse it and prevent it from ever being useful for anything again. It would no longer be fertile for generations to come. 
It would render it barren and unfruitful. Guys, envy and discontentment and complaining are to joy what salt is to cropland. What salt is to cropland, that's what envy and complaining and discontentment are to your soul when it comes to preserving the joy that God has commanded us to live in in all circumstances. Now, we don't have to live that way. For joy to grow, we have to get those things out of the soil. It's hurting you more than it's hurting anybody else anyway for them to be there. And it's defeating the hope of joy that you want to see there. What do we do? We confess. We just confess it to the Lord, yield it to Him, and do that repeatedly as necessary. And start practicing thankfulness and prayer. Remember, they're a, tr- they're a triple muscle group. When you practice thankfulness and you practice prayer, you will start to experience joy. Practice thankfulness. Practice prayer, and before long, you'll have a flower bed full of joy that can weather all circumstances. No more salt in the soil. All right, as we end today, I want to talk about this all circumstances command for joy. It's easy to be joyful when things are going well. It's easier. I won't say it's easy. Easier. It's harder when things aren't going well. It's downright difficult. There is a hard part of all in all circumstances. This principle applies. The greater the pain is turned up, the harder it can be to hold on to joy. I'm not telling you anything you don't know already. Compare these two. A flat tire in the rain on the way to an important meeting when you were already late. Frustrating. Joy killing, maybe, for that day. Or a cancer diagnosis for yourself or someone that you love dearly. Higher pain. Harder to hold on to joy. Now, I'm not saying, I don't want you to get the impression that when it says have joy in all circumstances, that it means have happiness in all circumstances. Grief and lament, they have a place in our emotional wheelhouse. Jesus himself experienced and expressed them as did David and others. We're going to read a short part of Psalm 13 here in a moment. They're not bad. They're not sinful or inferior emotions that we should try to whisk away, but nor do they have to displace joy in your life. That joy is predicated on the promises of Christ. It will be the anchor that can hold you through those painful experiences and through that season and that time. There's a great truth that so many Christians who have suffered know well, and it's this, that you can be both deeply sorrowful and deeply joyful at the same time. In Psalm 13, David expresses this, how to hold on to joy in the midst of pain. I'm going to read it along here. Psalm 13 starts in a really hard place. He's really disoriented. And as he wrestles through that with the Lord, he comes to a place of peace. So pay attention. Listen to the pain. How long, O Lord? Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and every day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes. That means help me understand. Or I will sleep in death. My enemy will say I have overcome him and my foes will rejoice when I fall. You can hear the pain. You can hear how disorienting it is. He's grappling to understand. God, why am I enduring these things and where are you in the midst of it? But then we see the anchor. Verse 5, but I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. Verse 2, he said, every day I have sorrow in my heart. Verse 5, he says, my heart rejoices in your salvation. Finally, he says, I will sing to the Lord. 
for he has been good to me. When pain comes, not if, when it comes, you cling to God's promises. You cling to his faithfulness and you remember Jesus' work in your life and his promise to bring it to completion. You remember the hope of heaven and the end of all suffering that will come shortly and swiftly. And remind yourself of this, that Jesus will produce glory for himself and for us even by this trial. We'll end with this. Johnny Erickson Tata is well known as a speaker and artist. She's a paraplegic. She was in an accident, a diving accident, where she broke her neck when she was a late teenager, 18, 17, 18, 19 years old. She's lived her entire life uh, as a paraplegic in a wheelchair. As a part of her injuries that she sustained, she has had excruciating chronic pain for all of her life. She's a cancer survivor. After beating cancer, she was re-diagnosed with cancer again and had to endure treatments again. But she knows well that God will produce glory for himself and for us. And she reminds herself that this will pass and it will ever be surpassed in eternal life. And this is how I know I'm going to share this quote. Yes, I do pray that my pain might be removed, that it might cease. But more so, I pray for the strength to bear it and the grace to benefit from it and the devotion to offer it up to God as a sacrifice of praise. Where do you get that? Come to the storehouse of God. Come to his storehouse and take freely what he desires to give. He desires to give you the strength that you need, the grace that you need, and meet you in your devotion. When it fails, where it's weak, Christ will be strong. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, this is a hard message, but a hopeful one. And I am so thankful that our joy isn't circumstantial. Would you teach us this kind of joy? Would you train us this week to be proficient at wielding joy and prayer and thanksgiving as practices that come from a heart of loving you, Jesus? And would you transform us, unconform us to the world, transform us to be renewed in our spirit and in our mind by your word. And may we test it by living it out and find it to be reliable and satisfying. I pray this over us this week. And all God's people said, amen. All right, let's read this final closing together. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. Go in peace this week. Thanks, brothers and sisters.